Western and Pacific on C-SPAN's Q&A. Washington Journal continues. Uh, joining us from Toronto, Canada, is Mubin Sheikh. He is the co-author of the book Undercover Jihadi. Mr. Sheikh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, tell us about your book. Why did you write it? Uh, well, um, I really wanted to put a message out uh, for really other young Muslims uh, to be able to pick the book up and kind of maybe see reflections of themselves in it. Um, for academics to be able to make sense of this topic of radicalization, what happens to people, um, you know, how do group dynamics play a role in all of that. So there, there were multiple reasons for doing it, and um, it came out at a good time. Mr. Sheikh, you talked about your own adoption of radical ideas. Tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get to that point? Yeah, well, uh, I... Um, yeah, I went to school, public school, during the daytime. Um, it was a very mixed environment. Uh, boys and girls could, you know, talk to each other. Uh, very caring, nurturing environment. And, um, you know, as opposed to in the evening, I would go to Quran school. And in the Quran school that I went to, it was like the uh, Indian or Indo-Pakistani madrasa system, where, you know, boys and girls are separated. Uh, you, you sit in front of wooden benches, rocking back and forth, not understanding a word of what you're reading. And if you made a mistake, you were slapped, you were put into stress positions. Uh, so this, this you know, severe contrast, I believe, laid the foundation for an identity crisis that would manifest later on in my life. And uh, when I got to high school, you know, I wasn't picked on, I wasn't bullied. Uh, we were one of the cool, you know, I was one of the cool kids. I mean, we were all uh, part of the in crowd, so to speak. But, uh, you know, a stupid thing, I, I had a house party. And my father was uh, out of the country. He had told his brother, my uncle, to check on the house while he was gone. So, of course, in the middle of the house party, my uncle walked in. I'm 17 years old, teenager, all his friends are there. It was the end of the world for me as far as I was concerned. Um, but uh, I was basically shamed into feeling so bad about what I had done that I convinced myself the only way I could kind of uh, make amends with my family was to, quote, unquote, get religious. And um, to do that, I, I went to India and Pakistan on a four-month religious trip. And while I was in Pakistan, I would have a chance encounter with the Taliban. And that's where um, I was bit by the jihadi bug, as I call it, and, um, and became a supporter of both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda after that. Uh, we'll speak more about that instance, but if you want to have questions of our guest about his experience, as you've heard so far, and his thoughts on radicalization, uh, 202 for Republicans, 202 for Democrats, Independents, 202 for Muslim Americans who want to give and ask our guest questions, 202 Take us back to Pakistan, Mr. Sheikh, that experience with the Taliban. What happened, and why do you think it influenced you so much? Uh, well, this would have been, uh, this was in the summer of 1995. Um, I had gone to a place called Kuwaita. Uh, Kuwaita at that time was a stronghold of the Taliban. And later on, Kuwaita became the uh, nerve center for the Taliban Shura, uh, their ruling council. Um, and when I showed up in the place, uh, I, had, I had no understanding of the politics of the region. I didn't know who the Taliban were. I, didn't, I w wasn't really paying attention to, to a lot of what was going on. I had heard stories about, you know, the, obviously the Soviet invasion that took place in Afghanistan, 79 to 89. And then, you know, there was the uh, inter-Mujahideen war uh, from 90 to 95. And uh, I was walking about the area with a local fixer. Um, and the group that I had gone with was an apolitical religious group who... Uh, they encouraged other Muslims to be more religious. Uh, the, 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 you know, the idea was that the more you fast, the more you pray, God will bring about change in the world. And so as I walked around the local area, I could see um, you know, some bearded men, uh, with turbans, robes. And so I drew nearer to them, um, thinking that they were religious people. And as I came closer to them, I realized you know, these guys are armed. They have a lot of weaponry on them. And so uh, a, a guy like me at that moment, coming from the background that I came from, identity crisis, seeking some kind of validation in the Islamic context, uh, seeking some kind of uh, Islamic persona that would resonate with me. So I was young, adventurous, 
and I saw these guys, and that was it. I mean, uh, for a lot of people, not just at that time, but even up to today, uh, look upon these groups as, um, you know, like heroes from the days of old. You read about the stories of the companions of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, and, and now here I am. I'm, I'm actually looking at people who I think are like them. And so I became completely enamored by them. Um, they presented to me a category of hero that I could, uh, that I could buy into, so to speak. Uh, you talked about this and wrote this in your book and learning about the topic of jihad. You wrote that jihad in its military sense was only taught as a ne necessary evil of life, unlike how terrorist groups like ISIS now teach where jihad by itself and the jihadi is revered and life is renounced. Talked a little bit about what you learned about the topic of jihad and what the Quran says about it and, and how you think it's practiced today. Well, the, the literal meaning of jihad means struggle. And so when it's applied in the context of combat, that when you struggle in combat or to get to combat, so you're struggling regarding your family, regarding you personally, uh, that's what jihad means, that struggle. So when you're, when you're struggling in war or in a combat situation, this is the secondary meaning of jihad. So for all intents and purposes, uh, when you do hear jihad, it's referring to the combat form, uh, the, the combat form. Um, and the, in Arabic, in the Quran, the word qital, qital means fighting. Okay, so jihad doesn't mean fighting, it means struggle, but it's used in the context of fighting. Uh, and uh, this is what I had learned when uh, I learned that the, the Taliban told me in 1995 anyway that if you want to bring about change, I mean, yeah, prayer and fasting and all that stuff is great, but you got to do it with this. And he held up his AK-47. Um, so for, as far as they were concerned, I mean, jihad was for them, um, you know, whether, a, whether you frame it under the doctrine of self-defense uh, or offensive warfare, uh, this is really the understanding of jihad as people understand it. I, I want to just finish off that point by saying that jihad is a war tradition. It is a legitimate war tradition with rules of ethics, uh, with rules of engagement. And what people do today in the name of jihad is not jihad, it's terrorism. And the two cannot meet. Uh, Mubin Sheikh, our guest, he's the co-author of the book Undercover Jihadi, talking about his experiences, and we'll talk to a little bit more about his experiences. But our first call for you, sir, is from John. John's in Massachusetts on our Democrats line. You're on with our guest. Go ahead. Hi, Mubin. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if you know this or not. I, I'm not that religious, but you might be. There was an article, and actually a court case, about um, one of your uh, people, uh, a woman, that worked for Abercrombie and Fitch, and she sued them because of her religion. She was there for five years, and they told her when things were unfair that uh, I noticed that you have a crucifix on your person. The next time you go back to work, I want you to hide your crucifix. And she said, I cannot do that. Well, if you do that, then we're going to fire you. So, to make a long story short, she sued the company, and it went to the Supreme Court, and she won. And the only negative vote was Clarence Thomas. Now, I don't know what your background is in religion. If you worked for Abercrombie and Finch, would you have sued her, uh, sued the company? <laughs> well... If we're going to live in a society that uh, extols the virtues of religious freedom and that religious freedom is taken away, you're at a workplace, you lose your job because they're forcing you to choose between your faith and your job, uh, they're, they're going to be responsible for that. So I, I would certainly take that opportunity to, to teach them a lesson, so to speak. Let's try Annapolis, Maryland, Independent Line. Nick, you're up next. Nick, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I had a specific question about uh, the specific tenets of uh, Islam and, and the Muslim religion that led you first to justifying jihadist theory, and then what tenets of that religion led you to refute what you originally used to justify it beforehand. So where, where did the shift in uh, perspective come in? I always give the analogy that religion is like a hammer. 
uh, you can either build a home with it or destroy a home with it. It really does come down to the perspective you have, the, the world view that you hold. So in the beginning, when I was young, angry, looking for an identity, a little bit of adventure, um, for me it was the idea of being cool, I think. Uh, the, you know, I fell into it because uh, it, I hadn't really had even any religious training. Uh, but yet I came to believe what the Taliban had told me because they looked cool. Uh, they were obviously religious people, so I mean they had beards and turbans. I guess that means they were, they were religious people, uh, which is not the case. But I mean, that's how I thought. And uh, when I eventually went to Syria in 2002 after the 9-11 attacks uh, and studied the religion properly, so you learn the rules of interpretation. You don't just pick up the book and start reading and then you know, decide to give your own interpretation. I studied how to interpret the book, the historical context, uh, the literal meaning of words and verses, and that uh, contextual understanding of the religion is what got me out of it. So I would say a more superficial, emotional aspect is what got me into it, and, and I would say that is what gets a lot of people into it today but the, uh, the, the more um, intellectual approach got me out of it. And so you were led by a, a moderate in helping you understand the, the, what the Quran said and everything it said in its context? Yes, um, it, it's funny because my, my oldest son, his name is Mujahid. Mujahid is like, you know, plural is Mujahideen, somebody who does jihad. And this was in, you know, he was born in uh, 1999, so I was still kind of on that side. Uh, and in, in the Arab world, they call you Abu, meaning father of your oldest child's name. So I was Abu Mujahid. So when I answered uh, that my name to the teacher, that my name was Abu Mujahid, he asked me, he said, oh, are you a jihadi? And I said, yes, yes, I was. And he says, oh, so, uh, you know, and then he began to challenge me on my understanding of the word. But then he, he realized he didn't want to put me on the spot. So he said, you know what? Let's follow up with this after class. And then he did. And then he said to me, you know what? We're going to study the verses on jihad, you and I. Because he knew I was from Canada. He knew I was going to go back to Canada. And he wanted to, to educate me and then go back to Canada to educate other people. And so, so uh, I spent uh, almost two years with this imam. We went through every single verse in the Quran that uses that term or that has the context of fighting. And we contextualized it, and that's what, that's what got me out of it. Our line for Muslim Americans this morning, 202-748-8003. Hussein in Jamaica, New York. Thanks for calling. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir. And uh, Mr. Nabeen, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, brother, I, uh, you are just like a son. I am 76 year old. So I have one question. That about 1,000 years ago, Sir, the Pope, he asked the French friendly that God has chosen you go and liberate uh, Jerusalem. It is a historical fact. If you go on Muslim Media and org, you can find. And the Christian world, they said, uh, they said, uh, love back in, uh, in their own language. And sir, the Crusader, they started. Muslim and Jews, they were murdered in Jerusalem indiscriminately. And this crusade remained 2000, more than 200 years. So kindly help me what option the Kashmiri has, what options the Palestinian has. They tried everything. They did not start a jihad. And what is the difference between armed resistance? Jefferson here, as a student of history, sir, with due respect, he said, give me liberty or give me death. So kindly help me what our grandchildren, our children, they have any option left uh, except armed resistance. I am the last person who will ask for armed resistance. I was eight years old. And I saw Hindu and Muslim women, they were brutalized in Pakistan and India. So kindly help me what option the Muslims have. What happened in Central uh, this African country? They took Muslim uh, limbs and they, they ate them. So what option Muslims have or your generation have? Okay, who's... 
Hussein, yeah. uh, we want to let our guests respond because you're giving them a lot of questions. So we'll let our guests respond. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Um, so uh, just to, to re, I mean, um, the point was about the Crusades and when you have these grievances, what do you do about it? Uh, you know, there is in the rule of law. The rule of law is very important for us to frame our responses within. Even in the time of the Crusades, when, you know, some of the worst abuses were, were taking place, the, the Salah al-Din, or Saladin, as the Europeans call him, he did not return that kind of um, violence. So, for example, you know, one of the things where the Christian crusaders would throw, you know, dead, rotting corpses over the walls right, in the hopes of infecting people, and it's biological warfare. But we, the, the Muslims were always told, or the Salah al-Din did not reciprocate, did not respond with the same kind of violence. Uh, this is based on one ayah in the Qur'an, let not your dislike for a nation cause you to be unjust. So even if they do those things to you, you are not allowed to reciprocate with the same kind of harm. This is also based on the hadith of the Prophet salam. You know, la darara wa la dirar. There is no harming, no reciprocating of harm. So our responses must be framed under rule of law. Now, on the other hand, um, even within the international system of rule of law, there is the rule of self-defense. So if you are being, uh, you know, uh, evicted from your homes, uh, persecuted because you're, are, you believe in one God, then you, then you can fight. This is something that is in the Qur'an. This is what the Qur'an said about jihad. Permission is given, uh, permission is given to you to fight those who evict you from your homes and persecute you because you say God is one. Uh, in the worldly context, it's called the law of self-defense. If people are, if the state or whoever is coming and destroying your home and killing you because you believe like what's happening against the Rohingya or wherever it is, then you are allowed to fight. Whiting, Indiana. Paul on our line for Muslim Americans. Paul, good morning. Assalamu alaikum. What I'm going to tell you something. I've read the Quran 10,000, if not 20,000 times. I'm going to tell you this right now. Muhammad was a terrorist, and he wanted to be a terrorist. Read the Quran. He said he's going to kill people. He said he's going to do whatever he has to do. You, re you either become a Muslim or you die. Well, I, I, I read the Quran in Arabic, and the Prophet Muhammad salam, is not quoted in it even one time, uh, meaning that he doesn't say I anything. So... You might need to read it uh, 20,000 and one more time. Uh, from John in Illinois for our guest, Mubin Sheikh. Uh, John, thanks for holding on. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, John. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, my comment is that uh, uh, humility and uh, purity and chastity is... Uh, love for God and that uh, the Federalist Papers uh, mention uh, article number 8, number 11, and number 64, which uh, pertains to America. And uh, I believe that uh, this is completely contradictory to uh, reality if you read the Federalist Papers because the American Revolution was based on uh, letters 8, 11, and uh, 64 which say the unity in America, the union in America is uh, a mentality and uh, the revolution was based on this mentality, and we lost this mentality, and uh, we have to... Uh, uh, okay. Go back uh, to the mentality of the 1787 Constitution. Okay, John. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, off of Twitter, uh, a viewer asks, and he frames it this way, what is militant Islam's, and he uses the word beef, with America specifically? Uh, what is militant Islam, and sorry, what was... What is militant Islam's beef with America, or problem with America specifically? Oh, right. 
Okay, what's their effing problem with us? Is that the question? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I mean, the uh, you have to frame it in a historical context. We really do. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't put the blame uh, on, on the U.S. alone. I mean, the Sunni-Shia divide in Islam has been there for over a thousand years. I mean, there was no America then. Um, there was no Israel then. So you can't really blame, uh, blame them for that. But uh, really, if, if you look in the recent history, you can go back, you know, let's say we go back to 19, you know, 15, um, you know, 1916, Sykes-Pico, when the region was divided up between the British, the French, and the Russians. Uh, and then subsequently in the decades, if you look at the decades after that, you know, I mean, I understand the U.S. Um, approach. This is not really any different from the Muslim approach. This is something for the Muslims to pay attention to because we were also uh, colonialist and imperialistic. So it's funny when I see Muslims kind of criticizing what the U.S. does. And, and there's criticism, of course, uh, for both of us. I just said about my own uh, history or, I guess, Islamic history. And the U.S. Um, uh, foreign policy, that's really what it's been. Um, you know, coups in Iran... Um, you know, setting up proxy groups because it was always a fight between the Russians and the West. And in Afghanistan, you know, it was the British and the, the, the Russians, the Soviets. So really their problem is that they see what the U.S. is doing, um, propping up dictators, dictators who then oppress, suppress the people, dumb the societies down. And then, then we point at the societies and we say, look, these people aren't able to produce anything. It must be because of their religion. Right? And that's a false uh, observation. Right? It's because of the, the society that they've been subjected to. Now, I'm not saying that it's only the fault of the U.S. Uh, Saddam Hussein came to power by a coup. Uh, Gaddafi came to power by a coup. It's not, it wasn't U.S. engineered. But there are cases where, and the U.S. is just politicking. It's doing it, the geopoliticking that other empires before it have done. So that's what's ticking them off. They're seeing that the U.S. is in Muslim lands, massive military deployments, and they don't like it. Uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Curtis, good morning. You're next. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask a question. I understand that um, finally someone got on and uh, tried to explain, you know, the do's and the, and, the, and the don'ts of the religion, because I think it's a misconception that uh, everyone is wrong about these people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if I understood the point correctly, that, uh, look, you, you, we cannot make generalizations about any group. I, I used to do this. I used to do this to Christians. I used to do this to Jews. I used to do it to Hindus, to Buddhists, you name it. I had a generalization. And then I met them and talked to them and studied a little bit more. And I may not necessarily agree with all points of doctrine, but if I'm dealing with a human being that has a good attitude and good character, then I don't care what you believe. I'm going to judge you based on your character and not your religious doctrines. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, you were recruited in one way. What do you see in the modern day about recruitment? And specifically speak to this idea of social media being used and the Internet being used in order to recruit uh, followers. You know, I'm, 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 I'm just about to be 40 in, in a couple of months. Uh, and, and I'm that old that I can say... Uh, I was around in the early 90s when it was still uh, Yahoo Chat, AOL Chat, and there was really, that was the first uh, exposure to social networking that I had anyway. Um, and it's vastly different than it was even then when I was 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, and what you're seeing is, you know, the idea of you don't even have to get out of your home to develop a social network to develop intimate relationships with other people that can then influence you in ways which uh, really uh, you, only somebody in real life could do that. So I think that's the main difference that I saw from back then than, than today. Uh, the, the rate at which people can interact with other people, the, at the scale at which they can do it, so international. I mean, you can be talking to somebody from, I mean, all different corners of the globe today that you couldn't do back then. So I, I really think the social media um, factor plays a, a very large role in not just uh, creating new dynamics related to recruitment and radicalization, but uh, a completely new experience of human interaction. Uh, North Chicago, Illinois. Robert, you are on with our guest, Mubin Sheikh. Hello. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just have uh, a comment uh, in regards to 
a lot of the problems or hostilities Americans have toward Muslims or what have you. And, and you know, we, we, we see Christians uh, getting beheaded, and, uh, soldiers getting dragged through the streets in the Middle East, and people form an opinion based on what they see and what's going on in the Middle East. And uh, we go over there trying to help these people, uh, you know, provide democracy, what have you, and they still, these people want to uh, kill one another, and they have been for over thousands of years, as you had mentioned. And we, we get kind of fed up with that whole uh, uh, deal. And then, uh, you know, the Muslims uh, will cry racism in regards to, you know, being told to Abercrombie and Finch that uh, you, you got to, uh, you know, uh, wear certain clothes, sell clothes, even though they sell clothes to young kids. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we hear this uh, race baiting uh, and all the, the stuff that's going on under Obama now. And this whole the geopol- uh, geopolitics that you've mentioned is totally correct. We're over there because of oil and uh, c- contracts. And uh, this goes into the whole geopolitical uh, 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 arena that you had mentioned earlier. That, that's my main comment. That's the problem that people have with Muslims is uh, in regards to, you know, them killing one another and killing Christians in the Middle East. And we're trying to help these people unite and uh, provide democracy. And we, we're sitting back here uh, in the United States, and uh, as a veteran, I'm, I'm seeing this. I get frustrated that uh, we, we're, we're, we're uh, forced to adopt their, their religion and their way of life. We, 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 uh, they should be adopting and assimilating to our way of life. It's ridiculous. This is the United States, not the Middle East. And uh, if we, we, we uh, went there trying to force uh, religion, uh, we would get killed. Or people have been get, got killed in regards to all that. Robert, we'll let our guests respond. Uh, that's a good comment. I mean, um, you know, I really don't blame a lot of uh, Americans, especially, uh, given what they see being done in the name of Islam. Um, if I was, if I had not grown up in the Islamic faith, uh, if I had not been exposed to what I was exposed to, I would think that Islam is a barbarian religion. I would think that they, I mean, I would be very hard pressed to figure out how these people are worshiping God. Um, so I acknowledge that. Uh, and this is largely because of what these people, what people do in the name of Islam. Uh, so that's number one. The, 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 the perception that the people have is based on extremism a violent, uh, and a violent manifestation of the religion. Uh, but, you know, we look, we look, for example, you know, Lucy is walking down the street. She slips on a banana peel. And we, we say, oh, Lucy slipped because she's a klutz. No, Lucy slipped because of the banana peel. And I would submit that dictators, uh, lack of proper governance, that is the banana peel on which the Muslim world is slipping. So it goes back to this argument of if you're going to empower dictators, uh, then don't blame the religion because it's the dictators that are dumbing the people down to the point where they can't even come up with creative ways of dealing with their society. If you look at Islam you know, in, in various you know, time in history, the theologians were the scientists. I mean, there's a vast um, uh, uh, you know, uh, contribution to science, philosophy, math, uh, literature by the Muslims. So it is false to say that you know, the Muslim world can't do it, it's because of the religion. It's really, it has a situational attribution to it. And the last point, uh, you're right. I mean, if the, if the if U.S. was going to go there to, or, you know, to force religion, they would be, you know, that's the same thing with democracy. You, you, will, you cannot force a society to come to a system of governance that, is not, that doesn't resonate with them, and that's the problem. We need to, we need to develop uh, mechanisms which resonate with their sacred values and not just you know, ignore what their culture or their traditions are and then impose our own system. It just, just doesn't work. Mr. Sheikh, do you still reach out to those with uh, a radical mindset, so to speak, and what's the reaction you got? Uh, I do. I do it all the time. Uh, the reaction is within a spectrum, of course. One is, of course, uh, you know, you're an apostate, you're a sellout, you work for the intelligence agencies, you're not a real Muslim. Um, and some of them are like, well, I don't trust you, but you kind of make sense. So. I'll, you know, I'll just have one, you know, I'll have a raised eyebrow towards your opinions. And uh, the other category, I guess, really are those, they actually do end up listening. And uh, I've, been, uh, I've been dealing with a lot of people who, are, who have been of the mindset, who I've helped kind of bring them away from that mindset, and to have a, a regular, a proper conversation. You know, I'm brutally honest sometimes. Um, 
And I think uh, people, people like that. And especially the young people today, young Muslims, they're, they're, they feel alienated. They're, they're marginalized. You know, they, they see all around them that you know, everyone hates Islam. There is a war on Islam. That's the narrative. Uh, when, you, when you see you know, people making cartoons and mocking our prophet, peace be upon him, and then if you flip the script, it's, oh, you know, it's racism or it's anti-Semitism. Like, you, you can't say that there's freedom of speech and insult people's most sacred views and then when they insult something of yours, you, you say, well, it's not free speech in this case. So, we, you know, these are things that young people are seeing and they're trying to make sense of and they're, they're not able to make sense of it or they're struggling to make sense of it. So when you mentioned the cartoons about Muhammad, when you see acts of violence stem out from that, what initially goes through your mind in any level? Would you call it justified? Uh, it's never justified. I mean, what, what, what goes through my mind is how does this help our cause? Uh, the Paris attacks, Charlie Hebdo, uh, what happened with that? It was a struggling publication. They were making fun of everyone, you know, left, right, and center. And then these guys went and shot the place up, and then suddenly their subscription jumped like 1,500%. Now, then the, the pictures were being replicated and celebrated. So, so I take a utilitarian approach. I, I detest the images. It breaks my heart to see that. I don't insult other people's faiths, uh, myself personally. I live by example. Uh, you know, God says in the Quran, the Muslims believe that uh, do not insult their gods lest they insult your God out of ignorance. So, so this, this, the approach that they take of using violence is counterproductive. Uh, Mubin Sheikh, uh, Undercover Jihadi is the book that he has co-authored about his experiences. Uh, there's the book cover. As you look at it, we will hear from uh, Betty in North Carolina. You're on with the guest. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a, a good morning, by the way. I have a quick question about a passage in the Koran, and I apologize, I don't know it exactly, so I'm paraphrasing. But it's where you pretend to befriend your enemies so you can get in there and then, uh, I guess, do them harm or take advantage. Would you please um, tell me how that's not relevant? Because sometimes I think, you know, are these people really your friends or... Are they going by this section of the Korean? Thank you, Betty. Um, and I love this. I love the North Carolina drawl, by the way. Um, so thank you for that. I like to hear that in the morning. Um, the the concept that you're that Betty was referring to is called tukia, or it's been kind of said as takia, uh, or kitman is another one. And this is really courtesy of some of the uh, uh, Muslim haters out there who want to depict. You know, Muslims as they're, they're always lying. And, uh, you know, if, if they're shaking your hand with one hand, believe me, they got a dagger in the other hand just waiting to get you. So, so this idea, there, there is no Quranic passage actually that, that teaches this. Uh, this comes from the hadith. Uh, this is the statements of the Prophet or uh, things that took place in the time of the Prophet that the Prophet commented on. And this refers to uh, the, the classical uh, explanation of this was, if you fear bodily harm or death because you believe in God, then you're allowed to deny that you believe in God. This is what Christians did, what Jews did, what Muslims did when people were persecuting each other. So when, let's say, the Muslims were forcing the Christians at one point, the Christians denied their faith. Or when the Romans were persecuting them, they denied their faith. Or like in the New Testament, when Peter denied knowing Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So that's, that's the traditional uh, classical understanding of taqiyya or, you know, denying your faith. In the operational context, it's what in the West we call denial and deception. Or it's something that a spy does. A spy doesn't tell people who he is and what he's up to, uh, but goes off and does what he's doing. So there are varying levels of it. Uh, the idea that, I mean, operationally, people who are up to no good are going to uh, operationalize that concept and to say that well here Islam allows me to deny my faith ignoring of course that it says well if you feel that your life is in danger it, there's no there's no license to just go around and lie to people uh, and pretend you're one thing and you're not so people abuse that uh, in this in this context but I would say just to close that point uh, you know what was I doing Takia when I was telling guys that I was one of them but I wasn't, but I was really trying to stop them. So that's a level of denial and deception that I would think is acceptable to us. 
Um, so there's a whole spectrum of it. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, because you brought up the topic of spying, uh, a little bit about your book, just to close about your history. After your mindset change, you go back to Canada, you end up working with the Canadian government to look out for those who might be radicals. Can you give our viewers a short history of how that worked out? Um, so after I had gone and met the Taliban and got radicalized in 1995, I kept that up until the 9-11 attacks. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, I, I initially celebrated the 9-11 attacks. And as the day went on and the severity of the event uh, started to manifest, uh, I, I, I thought to myself, wait a second, you know, something is not right about this. I mean, the, I, I, I get attacking combatants, but I mean, flying a plane into a building, innocent people, I mean, like, how, how do you explain that? So. So I went to Syria, studied two years, I got out of my mindset, I realized how bad it was over there, came back to Canada in 2004, and you remember that Quran school that I referred to early on in my, uh, in my comments? Well, uh, a guy had been arrested in 2004, uh, the first week that I had returned back from Syria, and he was the kid who sat next to me in that Quran school. And I approached the Security Intelligence Service to give a character reference for the family, uh, but by then it was too late. The intelligence service, of course, was very interested in speaking to me. Uh, and we chatted for about an hour and a half, two hours. And they put to me the prospect that, look, would you be willing to work for us as an undercover operative and you tell us who you consider to be the threat and who isn't the threat based on your, on your knowledge of the religion and your ability to interact with these people and size them up, basically. And so I accepted and I did that for a year and a half. I conducted several infiltration operations, uh, d did some things online, uh, many, most of the things on the ground. And um, later on in, uh, in the year 2005, one of those cases became a public prosecution. And I was basically given the, cha uh, the option, look, shake, either you walk away from it, let somebody else deal with it, or you follow through with it, and you're going to be in court giving testimony, your cover's going to be blown. But... I thought to myself, you know, this is, this is doing the right thing. Let me follow through with that. And so all, my identity was exposed. I gave testimony in four legal, uh, five legal hearings over four years, uh, faced a lot of backlash from the community, ostracized for a while, uh, people thinking that, you know, this was all a setup. And this is a problem I think you're dealing with in the U.S. There's a lot of mistrust with federal agencies and law enforcement intelligence agencies and the Muslim community. And, I mean, you can see from the Boston case that just happened uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, uh, the Muslim community, there, there's no trust. There's a, there's a, a severe lack of trust. Um, so I, I had to navigate through this space. And in that time, I did a master's degree in policing intelligence and counterterrorism, kind of made sense about all these things. And so I've come from that whole perspective of been there, done that, uh, be operationalized. And really now, uh, I still consult with governments, uh, mainly you know, Western governments. Um, but look, I take a pro-Islamic approach and uh, violently anti-terrorist approach. Uh, Selena, Ohio, Ali, good morning. Hey, good morning. I want to say first, number, I'm going to say a few points. Number one, God bless American Constitution. I've been to trip to Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, and London. There is no country like United States. I'm, I'm to the right of libertarian. I'm follower of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Les Sefer. Next to my friend, I was born and raised Syrian with a lot of literature and physician. He should define what jihad. Lesser, a greater jihad is struggling to put bread on the table. Putting bread on the table, Guinea Le Pen, French. And, and lesser jihad is to fight for survival. Now, let me tell you number two. After the fall, please give me time. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the late Novak, Bob Novak, and, and Pat Buchanan, they said on, on a crossfire, now the Soviet Union gone, they look for new enemy, so they set up the Muslim world. You know, they need enemy for the corporate. Number three, I came from Turkey back to Egypt. Egypt is dirty and poor and corrupt. Let me tell you, all related to the topic, you give Egypt $100 billion, it's gone in the sand. Number four, Turkey is rising like Germany. And, and the West, particularly France and U.S. government, everybody antagonizing Turkey, they don't want democracy in the Middle East. They are hypocrites. The French, they call themselves liberal, secular. I don't trust them because, you know what? I, am, I, I was born Muslim, I'm agnostic, and my philosophy Quaker pacifist. I'm near Erlham University. I, I, I love the Jews. I could go to Skokie, Illinois, raise 
raise Nazi flag, but that's bad and vulgar and, and a criminal, and I'll be protected by the freedom of expression. United States is the best country in the world because of George Washington and his companion. I tell people when I leave, listen, I believe in God, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, but my prophet George Washington, because he gave me rights, I'm neither Anglo-Saxon, nor Christian, I have right like everybody. Number okay, four. Ali, we, Ali, we got to let our guests respond to what you already put out there, but thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Sheikh. No, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a good sentiment that, uh, that he expressed. I mean, uh, the U.S. Constitution is a great document. Uh, I mean, I would say really, uh, I think you're in competition with the Canadian one, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll tolerate you guys for now. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Sand in Virginia, Don. Don from Sandston, Hello. Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to get the understanding that the Quran speaks that you should not, a Muslim should not fight against those who do not fight against you, that, that you should not harm the elderly, plants, or animals. So I don't understand the justification how anybody could say they're a Muslim and study the Quran for a hot minute. How could they even miss that unless somebody mislead them? And then at one time, particularly in this country, they didn't have a method. They wasn't, wasn't told about a method about the, of the Salafia. Now the Salafi method saying those who follow Prophet Muhammad, well, he never did those things. He didn't, he didn't support those type, kind of things. I don't, so I don't understand. And killing another Muslim is to go straight to hell. I don't. I mean, to me, it's, the whole sort of thing is crazy, and 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 to celebrate 9/11, uh, you know, I guess you could consider me a, 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 an apostate. Yeah, I'll admit because at one time I followed the religion, but there's so many things that just turned me off. And 9/11 was one of the main ones. I knew a lot of people there, and there's other things in the religion that I had a problem with. I respect Islam as far as the knowledge that I got from it, but there's a lot of ignorance and some things that can't be, you can't, Prophet Muhammad used the camel. We don't have no camels to follow in this country. We, go, we have cars and there's all things that I just didn't agree with. So I would like to know what's your response to the, the ignorant followers of, of uh, these radicals? That's a, that's a good question. And really, if it was on, if it was based off of the example of Muslims, uh, I wouldn't be a Muslim myself. Um, and uh, I am a Muslim only because of the religion itself and what I've understood from the religion. And it pains me, of course, to see what Muslims do in the name of religion, complete ignorance, breaking the rules. Um, and there's, I mean, we have to look at things in their context. You know, 1,400 years ago, uh, the Quran was speaking, you know, God spoke to people in their context. It would make no sense for him to mention the Internet 1,400 years ago. So, of course, they talk about slaves, they talk about camels. You know, that's the kind of life that they lived. And the mistake, I think, that Muslims in general make is thinking that we need to replicate society from, you know, the 700s in desert Arabia. You know, as if to say God had frozen, you know, divine wisdom in that time period. So, you know, I, I, will, I totally agree with you. I understand why people think the way they think. And all I can say is it's important for them to, to, to experience and understand the real Islam. Uh, you said you are married. The book says you're married. You had children. How do you talk to them, A, about your experiences and currently issues uh, concerning moderate Muslims and, you know, people who might try to influence them? Uh, I'm very open with my children. Uh, I've had this conversation with them uh, a while ago. My oldest is 15. My youngest is going to be seven. Uh, I have five children, uh, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl. Um, and uh, I'm putting them through a form of social engineering. I always say, uh, you know, I've, I've, two of them are in the Army cadets. I think you guys call them uh, Army explorers or something. Um, so they're in the Army cadets. I'm, I'm raising them with the values of duty, um, mostly, uh, and uh, religious understanding. I give them a holistic understanding. I've, I told them that, you know, I, I used to be a government agent. You know, I, my job was to stop bad Muslims from doing bad things. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, he said, protect, he said, support your brother when he's the oppressor and when he's the oppressed. So the companions replied, we understand to support him when he's the oppressed, but what do you mean support him when he's the oppressor? He said, stop him from his oppression. So 
I, I don't make uh, I, I don't make any excuses. I don't I don't need to. I don't apologize for what I did. Um, extremism, terrorism is completely against the religion. It's ruining the name of Islam, and I'm not going to apologize for stopping people from doing that. So they understand that, they respect that, and um, I, I like to think they appreciate that. Do the older ones attend madrasa like you did when you were a boy? No, sir. Not going to happen. I am the madrasa for them. Uh, Norristown, Pennsylvania. Ernst, good morning. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum salam, Ernst. Listen, I, I was sitting here, I look at C-SPAN all the time. Thank you, Pedro, for being a host. And I really enjoyed your um, comments this morning concerning Islam. I'm 60 years old. I became a Muslim when I was 40. And listening to everything that you said today has done the religion, the Muslims in this country, a great service. So may Allah guide you, keep you, you and your family, inshallah. And thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. From New York, here is Anthony. Uh, good morning. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, and I'm really enjoying your guest uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Sheikh. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Sheikh, is uh, how do your parents feel about your endeavors today and your uh, authorship of your book? And thank you. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, I laugh because, uh, I, you know, my... My um, my ten year old, oh sorry, thirteen year old, um, he, he he says to me so, and they're both in the army cadets, and he says to me so, you lost your virginity in the army cadets, is that so? And it was the most awkward moment for me, uh, and so even my parents, my parents have read the book, and look, I was brutally honest in the book. I mean that was the point. I wanted to just lay everything out there, not hide anything. Um, but once upon a time, my parents wanted me to be religious. Then I got too religious, uh, and then they didn't like that. But now they're, they're extremely happy and very proud of me that I've kind of, you know, come full circle or, or evened out, as I say it. And uh, I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm happy that they're happy with me and, you know, honor thy mother and thy father, right? So... Um, it's, it's good. It's good. Because of the mindset you hold and your past experiences with the government, has your life been threatened or do you feel you or your family are threatened? Yeah, I get threats once in a while uh, from, you know, some keyboard commandos uh, online, it's maybe teenagers living in their mama's basement, whatever it is, if that's the caricature. Uh, but of course, you know, I don't completely dismiss and deny it. I mean, um, you know, I know there are people that are watching me and kind of uh, seeing what I'm up to uh, online anyway, and it's very possible that somebody could uh, could try to make a move at some point. I mean, you know, I thank God that nothing's happened um, so far, and, and I hope that it will continue that way. Um, but I, you know, I think about it. I mean, I understand that this is a risky area that I'm involved in, and, um, you know, I have faith in God, and um, and I take precautions as, as, as much as possible, as much as, uh, as is lawful in Canada. Uh, Dallas, Texas. Bob, good morning. Hey, good morning. I've got a question on Mohammed when he was standing in the desert and uh, the spirit more or less come to him and he says he his people was starving and he says pick up the sword so he attacked the Jews at the time for food and what's the difference between him and someone going down the street and say, hey, I want that TV, so I'm just going to take it. In other words, a thug. Uh, I, don't, I don't recognize that, that account. I don't know where, where that came from. In fact, uh, the Islamic story anyway is that the prophet uh, was meditating in a cave. And the angel Gabriel came to him and said, read. And he said, I can't read. I'm not one of those who read. Uh, so there was, no, there was no instruction to pick up the sword and attack the Jews. Uh, Athens, Ohio, Yuma, up next. Good morning. You're on with our guest. Yes, sir. I would like to, uh, to uh, just give a comment here at first. I'm 86 years old, a World War II widow. And... We have religions, lots of them, here in the United States. We have Christians, we have Jewish, we have Methodists, we have Episcopalians, and it doesn't seem like that they're 
uh, picking up guns and throwing at each other. Uh, another thing that uh, we, uh, we are living in a communist state right now because we have a Republican Party here who wants to rule the United States and eventually rule the world. They are on the Russian side. The Koch brothers give them money to buy a president. All the Republicans with the Tea Party, the Koch brothers finance them. And so we were half an inch of having a dictator, George W. Bush, in our government, and we realized that everything was wrong, going the wrong way. And now they have suppressed our voting. Uh, the Democrats are going are on the low side. It's all about money and oil. So that's, uh, there is a fight going on here right now in our country. That's Yuma from Ohio. This is Earl from Maryland. Earl, go ahead. Good morning. I'm prefaced by saying white man speak with folk tongue. My question is, how I haven't read your book, but how do you deal with the hypocrisy about the right or freedom of speech to draw cartoons of the prophet? But yet still, if you as a community do um, cartoons about the Jews killing Jesus, you know, which was a historical fact, would that be considered to be free speech or anti-Semitic? Well, this is the thing. You have to uh, identify it as hypocritical. Um, you can't, I mean, uh, encourage people to, uh, you know, internalize these values of freedom of speech and then not apply them equally across the board. I, I think the, the, the problem with that is people will see through that right away. And so if you really want people, I mean, your question was how do I deal with that? Like I recognize that you know uh, humans are are I mean, we're human. We we're going to make mistakes. We have these lofty ideals, and we always try to realize those ideals. But uh, often we fall short of realizing those ideals. So I recognize the human condition, and where I can uh, speak out against it and identify it, I do that. So that's how I respond to it. Here's the last call, Joanna from Maryland. Good morning. Hi, um, I have a, uh, a quick comment and a question. Um, after 9-11, I'm a Lutheran, died in the Lutheran. After 9-11, I realized that I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about Islam. Well, about four years ago, I passed my local mosque out here, and uh, it, there was a big billboard out, sign outside that said, Islam 101 for non-Muslims. And uh, a couple of friends and I from my church, we went ahead and took the class, and I learned so much, and it dispelled a lot of myths. I made a lot of friends. We had speakers from the uh, Islamic Center come out and speak at our church, so we're engaged in interfaith activities. And so one comment would be that we need a lot more interfaith uh, activities going on so people can learn to meet one another and, and understand one another and such. The other thing I wanted to ask our, your guest is for him to explain Boy, and I can't pronounce it. The term al warjis it, it means outlaw in Islam. And we had a speaker come out not too long ago and talk about ISIS and, and groups like that al -Qaeda, saying that they are not truly Muslims, that they are these outlaws. And could he explain that, please? That's fantastic. Uh, this is the best last question because, one, like you said, about interfaith activity is extremely important and I believe should be a pillar of CVE policy in the West, countering violent extremism. Uh, once we learn more about each other, Jews, Christians, especially because of the Abrahamic uh, union that we have and connection we have, it's very important for us to do that, especially with Christianity and Christians. Uh, Muslims also believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Um, there are common doctrinal points that we need to strengthen and double down on. So uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, the second part that you referred to was uh, Khawarij. So that's K-H-A-W-A-R-I-J. Again, that's K-H-A-W-A-R-I-J. The Khawarij were rebels. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, referred to them in the most disparaging manner. Um, he doesn't, there is no other group of people that were disparaged uh, by the Prophet than the Khawarij. The Prophet, peace be upon him, they were, they were rebels who would declare other Muslims as non-Muslim, the, thereby justifying violence upon them, killing them, robbing them, raping them. Uh, this is what ISIS does now. 
uh, using verses um, that, that were revealed regarding non-Muslims upon the Muslims. So declaring them as you know, uh, infidels, apostates, uh, this kind of approach, making war on anyone for any reason, for small reason. Um, so this is what you see ISIS doing. ISIS are khawarij. The Prophet, peace be upon him, referred to them as they are the dogs of hell. They are the worst creatures under the heavens and earth. Wherever you find them, kill them. So um, these kind of groups, the Prophet has um, castigated them in the worst manner possible and this is very important for people to look uh, to look into because when when people say oh isis is quoting the quran isis guys they pray they pray to mecca they fast well yes the prophet said that these people will come in the garb of islam they will fast and they will pray but they will falsify the meanings of the quran and deceive the people mubin sheikh is the co-author of undercover jihadi uh, there is the book cover. Mr. Sheikh, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. God bless. Our last segment, we'll take a look at uh, the issues that are important to the transgender community, especially when it comes to equal access. Mara Kiesling of the National Center for Transgender Equality will join us next as our guest. But first, this weekend on both CSP.